Uh, welcome everybody to today's Doctors in program uh, on the topic of summer safety. Uh, very timely as we move into uh, the middle of June already. Uh, for anyone who is new to Doctor is In, this is a collaboration between the Elder Initiative at William Way and Jefferson Health, uh, in which each month we have a given health topic and we have doctors from Jefferson uh, who come in to share their knowledge and expertise uh, and ask questions. Uh, and our topic today, as you see, is summer safety. And we are joined by Dr. Michael Danielevich, uh, who has done a couple of these programs with us, always a great presenter. Happy to have you back, Michael. Uh, Michael is a uh, geriatric fellow at Jefferson, uh, is finishing up that now. And next year, we'll be doing a palliative care fellowship uh, so hopefully we'll we'll be able to have you back, Michael, for more of these Doctor Is In programs next year. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before I turn it over to Dr. Daniel Levich. Uh, there are a couple of options for how you can share your comments and questions throughout the program. Uh, some folks are already using the Zoom chat. You can definitely pop your questions in there. Uh, do know that what you put in the chat does have your name attached to it. If there's anything more personal that you wanna share, uh, we recommend using the Q&A feature, which you can also find in the bottom toolbar of your Zoom screen. And when using the Q&A, there is an option to ask your questions anonymously. Uh, so if you have anything, again, more personal, uh, you can use the Q&A feature. Uh, there are a couple points in the presentation where Michael is gonna stop for questions. Um, still feel free to put your questions in at any time. Just know that I'll be reading them off uh, when we get to those points in, in the program. Um, and if for anyone who is watching us on Facebook, you can just put your, your questions in as a Facebook comment, uh, and I'll be checking that as well to relay those to, to Michael. Um, so with that being said, happy to turn it over to Dr. Michael Daniel Levich for today's program. So take it away, Michael. Excellent, thank you, David. Um, I apologize in advance. Um, my voice is still a little hoarse from a couple of weeks ago when I had COVID. So um, I may not be as clear. If anybody's having any trouble hearing or understanding me, please let us know. But like David said, we're gonna try to talk about summer safety today. And some of this talk I will say is kind of, um, you've probably heard these messages before. There's nothing super groundbreaking about parts of it, but what we're really trying to do is highlight some of the key features of staying safe in the summer, uh, especially as temperatures go up and especially as sun exposure becomes more of a thing. So we're going to start with that. We're going to talk about how to protect our skin in the sun, um, what to look for as far as skin cancer and what we should be worried about versus maybe not so much. We're also gonna talk about keeping cool in the heat as far as air conditioning, this idea of dehydration and heat exhaustion. At the end of each of these, as David mentioned, I will stop for questions. Um, if you wanna just put them in, we will get to them. Uh, the talk should be about 45 minutes, so we should have plenty of time for questions. So with that said, uh, let's start by talking about skin and sunburns. And these talks, I always think that I, you always come in with the scary data. So I wanted to start with some realities. Some of that is less than half of our older adults, meaning people over the age of 65, <clears throat> are actually using skin protection when going outside on sunny days. And that's not good because the majority of our melanoma cases, which is the most dangerous type of skin cancer, are occurring over the age of 65. Now, does that mean some of that is lifetime sun exposure? So to some degree, I don't wanna say the damage is done, but there certainly can be that history of sun exposure that then leads to this increased rate of melanomas in our older adults. But that said, melanomas can still arise newly in folks over the age of 65. The sun exposure now is still dangerous. Um, and when you actually look at the data of how many folks over the age of 65 are actually using sunscreen, that number goes way below half. It's something like, I think it was like 10% of people over 65 think it's necessary to use sunscreen. And we're gonna talk about why that is not always the case. So again, why is this important? Because folks who are 65, 
And I'll use that as kind of our start point to describe what older adults are. A 65 year old in the US can expect to live at least another two decades with current predictions. We know that overexposure to sunlight is the leading cause of skin cancer worldwide. <clears throat> and there is a lot of benefit in trying to prevent skin cancer to keep folks healthy and safe. So really we think about four major methods of protection. Uh, some of these will start with the most obvious, stay out of the sun. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, not rocket science there or stay in the shade. Doing things like using sunscreen, wearing a hat with sufficient coverage, so meaning a wide brim. And the one that's often easier said than done, which is wearing clothing that covers arms and legs. You know, nobody wants to be hot and sweaty on these warm, sunny days. So really, I bold sunscreen because it's the easiest one to do, uh, even though it can get annoying with reapplying. Now, some folks ask, well, if it's cloudy out, isn't that protecting me? And the answer is not necessarily. Clouds do not block all UV rays. Um, so you are still at risk as somebody who is very, very pale generally. Um, I have gotten sunburned in the clouds. I've gotten sunburned in the winter. Both of those things are still technically possible, but we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. So one of the questions that I get all the time is what kind of sunscreen is best? And you will go into your average um, convenience store and you'll find many different options. Generally, we as physicians recommend what is called broad spectrum sunscreen and most sunscreens you're gonna buy are this. What that means is that it protects against both UVA and UVB rays. And these different rays do different things. Um, they cause photo aging, and they also cause that transformation of normal skin cells into cancerous cells. We generally like to say SPF of 30 or above is considered ideal. Um, but at some point, once we get to SPF 50, those higher numbers don't help as much. It's almost like we'd say diminishing returns. The difference between SPF 30 and SPF 50 is about 2% of um, rays being blocked. The difference between 50 and 100 is something like 0.2%. It's a very, very small increase. So you'll see a lot of marketing, a lot of clever Neutrogena, all these expensive products trying to sell you SPF 100 plus. The reality is SPF 30 and 50 are gonna do about as good a job as that 100 plus. That said, different sunscreens do have some different properties for folks with different skin. Some people, even older adults, um, may end up breaking out if they use a very oily sunscreen. So you can block your pores, you can cause breakouts. Folks who are prone to that should really look for what's called non-comedogenic sunscreen. Um, these are generally more sheer sunscreens that are a little less greasy and uh, less likely to block your pores. There are also moisturizing sunscreens. So if you have dry skin, um, that's something to look into as well. The reality is this last part is the most accurate. It's like any medication I ever prescribe any patient. The best one is the one you're going to take. The best sunscreen is the one that you're actually going to wear. So if it just sits on your shelf or if you just carry it along with you and don't put it on, not really doing you as much good. So we talked a little bit about this. If you look at the difference between SPF 15 and SPF 30, <clears throat> you get about 4% increase in blockage of sun of UV rays. As you go beyond SPF 50, uh, sorry, I said 0.2, it's actually 0.3%. So don't drive yourself up the wall trying to find SPF 100. If you have SPF 50, that's going to do a pretty darn good job. Now, another thing that I get asked about, what about the risks of sunscreen itself? Um, there has been some really bad press recently for sunscreens. Um, some of them have been, where there was concern for a compound called benzene being found in the sunscreen itself. And to my patients, I say this, we can be as worried as possible about a recall as we want. I mean, we can really, anything can be recalled. But the good news is, because of our surveillance, we found the problem and actually recalled those sunscreens. The recall is, in a sense, a good thing. Is it a good thing that that happened initially? No, but we can't do much about that. So the FDA, as well as me, as well as pretty much any other doctor or healthcare professional you're gonna to talk to, is still recommending the use of sunscreen in addition to other sun protection efforts. 
because there is a known benefit to our sunscreen use. There is a known reduction in the, in, in the occurrence of new skin cancers. So I would say it's a good question to have, but we are, we are monitoring the contents of our sunscreen. And in this case, action was taken. So folks often say to me, I mean, I've certainly run into this myself. I put sunscreen on, I then went to the beach or I went to the pool or I sat out on my stoop and I still got sunburned. What am I doing wrong? Is my sunscreen defective? So one of the first things that you really wanna be thinking about before you even put your sunscreen on is to look at the expiration date. Um, sunscreen does expire, becomes less effective uh, over time. So if you have four-year-old sunscreen and you've just been using intermittently, probably time to get a new one. The other things are using the right amount. So really you should be putting in each part of your body a nickel sized amount and then applying that pretty liberally. You wanna make sure that you do have that broad spectrum SPF 30 or higher. You wanna make sure that you put sunscreen on before you go out into the sun. It sounds like that would almost be intuitive, but you'll often see folks get to the beach, sit around, kind of not wanna put their sunscreen on. And then they do it and they're already burnt. So then they just say, hmm, it's not working. Similarly, easy to miss spots. Um, folks have a hard time. I see back sunburns all the time. If you don't have somebody with you to help you put it in those hard to reach places, the spray on sunscreens can be a good option because they can um, spray pretty far. And then the one that everybody forgets, including me, I've certainly been guilty of this many times, really needing to reapply sunscreen, especially after going in the water, especially after sweating or being outside. This slide says every two to three hours, I would argue every hour and a half is, more, is reasonable. But again, as many times as you can apply as possible, that's gonna give you the greatest benefit. So when are we most at risk of sunburn? Again, some of this is really obvious. Some of them, I did put medications on here just to go through a few of them. So we really worry about what's called a high UV index, meaning there are more UV rays coming through at these times. Um, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., the sun's rays tend to be the strongest, the sun is highest in the sky. If we have decreased cloud coverage, Clouds do not block all UV rays. It's certainly still possible, like I said, to get sunburned when there is cloud coverage. But when there's a little bit of clouds like on a day like today, that's gonna to be better than a day where there are none at all. Higher altitudes, it makes logical sense. You're closer to the, closer to the, um, to the sun, essentially. Closer to the equator where the sun's rays tend to be stronger and the sun tends to be in the middle of the sky for more of the day. We know due to mostly human activities, there is a hole in the ozone layer. Ozone is a compound that helps to block and reflect UV rays. Um, because of this hole, it's more likely for us to have exposure. Those with lighter skin colors, especially those who have the, what we call type one skin. Um, so type one skin means that you are basically quite pale and often have red hair. So if you fit into that category, you are the highest likelihood of um, getting a sunburn. Folks who tan. Tanning is just, we do not recommend tanning under pretty much any circumstances in the medical field. Um, it gets, I know some folks do it. Tanning uh, just is pure exposure to UV rays. It does increase your risk of skin cancer. There is really not a safe way to tan, unfortunately. Uh, unless we use spray tan, which is a whole different, whole different story. Certain medications can increase the risk of sun, um, especially doxycycline is kind of the one that everybody thinks about. It's a very common antibiotic for skin infections, for Lyme disease, um, and for a bunch of other conditions. Doxycycline sunburns are such that folks will go out in the winter and they will get photosensitivity, uh, meaning they will have what appears to be a sunburn in the winter. So something to be aware of. If you're on a thiazide diuretic, examples of those being hydrochlorothiazide and chlorthalidone, those do have a slight increase in the risk of sunburn or sun sensitivity, um, not one that folks often think of. Some other antibiotics like Bactrim, then the fluoroquinolones, those being Cipro, Levaquin, um, being most common, do increase the risk of sunburn by just a bit as do NSAID pain medicines, Advil, Aleve, and Motrin. 
um, as do some treatments for other skin conditions like retinoids. Um, retinoids can be really good. We see them used a lot more in younger folks who have acne, but they uh, pretty notably increase the risk of sunburn as well. And then St. John's wort, which is a uh, compound that I worry about because, as a geriatrician because it seems to interact with absolutely everything. And that is true here with sunburn as well, uh, increasing the risk of sunburn. So you've got here a kind of standard sunburn and there are a couple of different levels of sunburn. One looks like this, which is essentially just a, what we call a first degree burn. Um, it's irritation, skin flaking, redness, uh, pain are the common hallmarks of that. When you get a worse sunburn, um, so this may often start looking like this on day one, on days two, three and beyond, you'll start to see some of this peeling of skin as the dead skin is replaced with uh, new regenerated skin. Some folks, unfortunately, uh, develop a blistering sunburns. These tend to be a little more severe. Um, they tend to be what we call second degree burns. Um, and the key with those, do not pop the blisters. You will, you leave your, they will pop on their own. If you just try messing around with them, you'll often see skin infections on the sunburn. So how do we treat sunburns? Um, really avoiding the sun to prevent it from getting worse. Um, if you are not on, if this is not something your doctor has told you to avoid due to either blood pressure or kidney issues or bleeding issues, and said medications like uh, Advil, leave and Motrin. Yes, they do increase your risk of getting a sunburn in the first place, but that anti-inflammatory effect can be really helpful for pain. The answer to everything in medicine, uh, in, unless you have heart failure, is hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Um, so drinking plenty of water. Using aloe vera, um, you can go and buy the gels at most of your commercial pharmacies, um, and that has a cooling effect. It's not necessarily going to make it heal faster but it tends to, heal, to help with the pain. If you have a pretty localized sunburn, so say if I had a sunburn right here and it's really bothering me, you can put small amounts of hydrocortisone on it. Uh, hydrocortisone being a steroid, um, do not slather your whole body in that. I've seen that happen, it's not good. Don't put hydrocortisone or steroids on the face or on the genitals. Um, the skin in that area tends to be a little bit thinner and uh, long-term use of st topical steroids is just not the best. Oatmeal baths can be really helpful for um, discomfort, similar to poison ivy, uh, which I actually didn't cover in this talk, but we could also talk about that if folks are interested. One second while I get this moving, there we go. The other thing that we always forget to is protecting the eyes uh, in the sun. The best sun protection uh, is using sunglasses with UVA and UVB protection, also known as the UV 400 rating. Those are good sunglasses. Uh, UV rays can do a number of things to eyes. They can increase your likelihood of eye cancer, of cataracts, of what we call sunburned eyes or photo damage to the retina, the back of the eye that helps us see. You can also develop growths on or near the eye. Um, some of these are benign, some of these may also be cancerous. So remembering, especially folks with lighter eyes tend to, like myself, tend to be a little bit more sensitive to the sun, um, making sure that we're protecting not just our skin, but also our eyes. So I will pause here for a moment and we can take some questions if you all have them. So there's one that's come in so far. Uh, which was knowing that there are a lot of recipes out there for homemade sunscreens. Do you find those to be effective or recommend staying, staying away from those? I do recommend staying away from them just because we don't have validated studies of these homemade sunscreens. Meaning in order to sell a sunscreen and to claim UV protection in this country, like SPF, you have to be evaluated by the FDA and you have to meet certain standards. And I know some folks are like, well, the chemicals, the reality is it's those, some of those chemicals are helping block the rays. So as much as I'm about, I love, you know, making things at home is great. I would tend to stay away from them and stick to our validated sunscreens that have been tested. Other questions about sunburn, sun protection of any kind. 
if folks meant to put that in. Uh, the other one I wanted to ask was, so you mentioned that uh, sort of uh, lighter skinned, red haired people have the, the highest like, risk of sunburn. Does that mean sort of the opposite is true that, that people of color, people with darker skin tones it's, are facing it's, it's lower a very, risk? It's a very good question. And the answer is technically, people with darker skin tones are less likely to burn easily. I say that with a big caveat because it is still possible to sunburn even with darker skin as folks know. Um, and the risk of skin cancer is still there. Meaning folks with darker skin should still be wearing sunscreen and using these same sun protection methods because the risk of sun, of sun although the risk of sunburn may be lower, there is still the risk of what we call photo damage from those UV rays. There is still the risk of developing some of the skin conditions and cancers that I am about to talk to you about next. Thanks for bringing that up, David. And one other question that just came in, um, are there sunscreens that are fragrance free? There are, um, yes. And most sunscreen companies make one that is fragrance free. Um, and I'm not specifically plugging any products, but I know that Neutrogena has some that are fragrance free. Um, La Roche Posay, which makes the more the higher end sunscreens that all the dermatologists like to use, they also make them as well. I think even Coppertone does. So you should be able to find a fragrance free, kind of dye free um, sunscreen. Wonderful. Uh, so again, folks, and feel free to, to put your questions in throughout, but Michael, why don't you go ahead with the, the next section here? Sounds great. So in our next section, continuing on the theme of scary things to look for, uh, I'm not trying to freak people out, but I do want to talk about skin cancer and what to look out for, what's concerning. So there are really three major types of skin cancer. Um, the first two are the less severe types, and these are called basal and squamous cell carcinomas. You'll see an example of a basal cell here on the left and a squamous cell on the right. These are most frequently on the areas that are sun exposed. So you will often see a basal cell or a squamous cell in this triangle of the face, kind of between the eyes and nose. I just found one on one of my patients right on the nose. So you'll see it there. You can see it on the arms, legs, areas that tend to be sun exposed. Um, the good part about these types of skin cancer is that they tend not to spread from the original locations, which the danger of cancer is the spread usually, spreading and invading different areas. That's not to say they can be ignored because they can get quite large and become what we call locally invasive, meaning they start to press on things that are nearby. Um, they start to be cosmetically um, unappealing. And for folks with these types of cancers, Sometimes, as you can see here with this squamous cell one, they can start opening up and just looking kind of, um, they can get infected and just not appearing um, super healthy. Melanoma is the one that we're gonna spend a lot more time talking about today because it is concerning. It is the most deadly type of cancer, uh, skin cancer, one of the more deadly types of cancer in general, and it can spread. And it's a little bit unpredictable with how it does that. But we're gonna, again, not something to freak out about, but something to be aware of. So let's say you are looking in the mirror or you just notice a mole. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the ABCDEs <coughs> of is it a mole or is, could it be a melanoma? What we really look for, we'll, we'll go down the list. We look for asymmetry. Is the mole mostly symmetric from one side to the other? So if you imagine drawing a line down the center of it, is it a mirror image or is it at least reasonably um, with good edges? Borders, going off the edges idea, you really, in a benign mole, a non-cancerous mole, you're gonna see these smooth borders. Melanomas tend to be irregular, ragged, or notched. Um, they usually, they often have these blurred lines toward the edges, jumping into color. Melanomas also tend to have irregular colors. Um, they can be various shades of brown or black. They may have patches of pink, red, white, or blue, depending on what type of melanoma it is. Your normal mole is usually going to be more of an even color. So there can be a wide variety of normal mole colors, but as long as it's one color all over, you're 
probably in better shape. The diameter, the size matters as with many things. If it's less than a quarter of an inch, it is less likely to be a melanoma. If it is larger than a quarter of an inch, that's something a little bit more concerning. But that said, these things are not static, meaning they change. So if you have a small mole that doesn't meet a lot of these criteria, you look at it a few months later and you notice that it is evolving, changing, um, changing in size, shape, or color, those are reasons to see a doctor because these are things that you need to be aware of that could be a melanoma. Now, scary, obviously melanoma is a scary diagnosis, but if you're catching and treating it early before it spreads, um, melanoma can almost always be cured. It's one of the few types of cancer that we actually use the word cure for. So again, just being vigilant. Some folks come to me and ask, <clears throat> should I be going to a dermatologist and getting what they call a full body skin exam? And I will never say no to a patient who wants to do that, especially if they have kind of moles all over the place or if they are worried about some of them. The reality is for most people, going to your primary care doctor with your concerns and having them do an exam is probably going to cut it for most people. There hasn't been great evidence out there that full body skin exams are as useful as we'd like to think. That said, if you have access to a dermatologist and you have moles that you're concerned about, certainly a reason you can certainly see them and they are happy to do that and look at it with their little dermoscopes. Now, again, we are not gonna immediately pick up on every single mole that is you know, the average person is not going to be great at being like, well, this is a normal mole, this is a melanoma. There are some examples here of just how different melanomas can look. Um, so some of these, like this one here on the left, may not scare a lot of people, but if it's growing and changing, that is a melanoma. These are all melanomas. You can see here just how different sometimes they look. I mean, this one is dark brown and red. This one is pearly with those brown odd edges. This one is just red. So again, not trying to be like anything could be a melanoma, but if you're concerned about it, mention it to your doctor. It's important to remember uh, just a few take home points here. Like I said, not all cancers fit these patterns perfectly in that you can technically develop a basal or a squamous cell cancer on your chest, on your butt, on areas that are not getting sun. Melanomas, as we just saw, can look really different in different situations. But it's always good to be mindful of a few things. Any new spots that pop up, doesn't mean you need to rush into the doctor right away, but keep an eye on it. Areas that might look different from other parts of the skin. Lesions or moles that are not healing or that are opening up or crusting or just not looking quite right. Changes in the color of the skin and changes in the moles themselves. If you notice any of these things, like a scaly surface developing over it, if it's oozing or bleeding, or if it's developing new lumps or bumps, those are reasons to come on in. We're always happy to look at these things. And most of the time it's reassurance, but sometimes you may need to get a little skin biopsy. So what do you do if you're concerned about a mole? This is kind of not shocking. Schedule an appointment with your doctor. Primary care in many cases can be a good starting point especially since wait times for dermatologists are unfortunately on the range of months. If you have something that you're really concerned about it, bring it into your primary, have them take a look at it and have them either, you know, some primary care doctors such as family med trained folks can actually do some of these procedures in the office. If you are looking at something like a basal or a squamous cell or a melanoma on the face, especially, um, that we do tend to refer out to dermatology because they have a number of procedures that are less invasive than just kind of cutting it out uh, and have really, really good cosmetic outcomes. I really wish I didn't have to put this in here, but um, do not attempt to remove the mole yourself at home. Believe me, I've seen this happen more than, more than, more than I'd like to, actually. I've seen folks who have dissolved them, who have used... Um, Compound W froze them off. Please, please, please don't do this. Um, unless it is a wart or something standard like that. 
we really want to be helping you get these things off because we need to also get margins. What that means is when we take out something that we're concerned about a melanoma, we like to have an edge around it of normal tissue. Helps us ensure that we got it all out. Um, unless you are a dermatologist yourself, you're probably not going to be great at doing that at home. So I'm not trying to talk down to you all, but please, please, please do not attempt to remove moles at home. I'll open it up for questions about skin cancer. I think that's kind of a 90,000 foot view. It gets across the most critical points that I would hope that you all have, um, but open for questions again. So give folks a second to put questions in the chat or the Q and A. Um, Michael, can you just talk a little bit about kind of what that biopsy process looks like? Like what, what's being done, what, what yep. folks, what you're looking for as a doctor? 100%. So there are basically, there are a bunch of different types of biopsies, but I'll break them into, into a couple of categories. If you're seeing a lesion on the face that is concerning enough, what they will often do is they will take a small piece of it, um, either via, usually via what they call a shave biopsy. So they have this little device that looks like a flat blade and they will shave off part of that lesion um, and send it for pathology. Sometimes you will go in and you'll see your doctor, like with my patient a few weeks ago, I had a gentleman come in who was, had a big lesion on his face. It was a classic basal cell carcinoma. So I sent him to dermatology and they ended up removing it without even biopsying. So what they will often do for face lesions, if it's so obvious what it is, they will do a procedure called Mohs surgery, M-O-H-S. And the way that works, it's, it's a very complicated in theory, but it's actually really easy on the patient with a great cosmetic outcome. What they essentially do is they take tiny shavings. Uh, they will basically use this microblade to take layers off and they will look at it under a microscope as they're doing it. So they'll have somebody there taking the slide, looking at it, and they'll keep going and shaving off in tiny increments until they don't see any more cancer. It's a really incredible procedure. It requires a lot of training on the part of dermatologists, but that's one that's really very useful. If we have something on the arm or the leg and you go into your primary and I'm like, hmm, that's it, or on the back. And I say, hmm, that's a suspicious mole. I would like to take a look at it. There are a couple of ways I can do that. One is by doing what's called a punch biopsy, where we use this small uh, device. It almost, it's, it's just a little ring that has a blade on the end. We numb the area up and put that, uh, run the blade in, take out a sample of skin, send it off. Again, if we're really concerned that something is a melanoma, we might need to do what's called an ellipse biopsy, meaning we actually take the lesion out by essentially using a scalpel and cutting a little ellipse on that. But those are kind of the basics. These are all procedures that are done on the outpatient basis, meaning you don't get admitted to the hospital. Um, you will get local numbing, um, not general anesthesia or anything like that. All right, and there was another question that came in. Uh, oh, just how, how do you, so the question is, how do you tell if your mole is melanoma? And you did go through that a little bit, but I guess, if, is it, uh, just expand on that, how you tell yeah, sort of so melanoma well, ver versus basal cell or one of these other types? Exactly. So melanomas are the ones that have that A, B, C, D, E guidelines that I was talking about earlier. Um, basal cell tends to be, um, we, like I said, basal and squamous cell tend to be a little bit more obvious in certain ways. Like a basal cell, if I see this pearly lesion that has some scale over it that may have a few blood vessels in it. I'm like, okay, that's a basal cell. If I see this thing that is starting to uh, degrade a little bit with blood vessels inside and turning red, I'm like, oh, that could be a squamous cell. Um, if I'm looking for melanoma, I'm really looking for those asymmetry borders, color, size, and evolution. So melanoma can present so many, so many different ways that we're really looking for things that just don't fit with, let's say if you have 10 moles on your back, I'm looking at that one that just doesn't quite look like the others that has a mix of colors that's growing. So it's not easy in a sense, but there is, we're using that same algorithm that you all are using essentially like ABCD. 
And is, is the melanoma going to develop from an existing mole or is this going to be a new? It's, it's a good question. So there are really two ways that melanomas can develop. Um, one is from an existing. So normally when we see a mole, like let's say you have a mole on your arm, this mole on my arm is very, very, this will not transform into a melanoma. There are certain lesions that are more likely to develop into melanoma. One of them is called an actinic keratosis. Um, a lot of folks over the age of 65 have these. They tend to be, um, they're like light marks on the skin almost, like color change. And those are considered precancerous in some cases. So some may arise from that. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of an actinic keratosis. Many melanomas ar arise by themselves. So they are a new transformation. So we have normal skin cells that transform into melanoma, uh, usually due to sun damage. So yeah, it, it's, it could go either way, it's, it's essentially. Great, thank you. I think that covers the questions on skin cancer. Excellent. Uh, so we can move on to our other summer safety tips. Perfect. So for the last part, we're gonna talk a little bit about staying cool in the heat. Um, <clears throat> so what are we worried about with heat illness? It's a broad category. And there are really a bunch of different things that we have to think about. Sorry for my dog barking in the background. Um, hyperthermia is essentially a bot an elevated body temperature. And the most concerning thing that we worry about is heat stroke, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. And that is just a severely elevated body temperature, usually over 104 degrees. Um, when you think about our body, our bodies are meant to run somewhere between high 96 to 99s. Uh, anything above 101.4 is a fever. Anything above 105 is dangerous. Anything above 106 is really where the protein that makes up our body starts to say, I can't do this anymore and starts to fall apart. So this is what we worry about with heat stroke. And I'm gonna go into that a little bit on our next slide. Lower down, so if you think of this as a spectrum, heat exhaustion are the first signs. This is when we start seeing folks being tired, dehydrated, they might develop muscle cramps. It's less severe than heat stroke, but it's still concerning because it can lead to that. In our older adults, we'll also sometimes see heat edema. Um, which is just swelling. It's swelling usually in the ankles and feet, not necessarily dangerous by itself, um, but combined with some of these other things can certainly be. Heat syncope, obviously concerning. That means syncope is just passing out. Uh, dizziness or loss of consciousness after exercising in the heat. And then one of the less severe ones is heat cramps, which we'll talk a little bit about. So, who is at risk of issues in the heat? Anyone over the age of 65 in general, partially due to skin changes, uh, changes in circulation to the skin, changes in sweat glands, how well they work, how many there even are. Obviously anyone with heart, lung, kidney disease has to be especially careful in the heat. We're really, we, we talk a lot in medicine about fluid balance, meaning we want you to have not too much water in the body, not too little, just the right amount. And that gets hot, harder, when it gets really hot. People with low salt diets, uh, people with other unique dietary modifications may be at unique issue of, of getting dehydrated. People on certain medications, similarly. Folks who are taking diuretics, medicines that are making you pee. People who are taking sedatives. People on certain heart medications, including beta blockers, can be at a greater risk of having heat issues. Obviously, if you're not drinking water, <laughs> And not always so obviously, everyone loves having a drink outside in the summer. Um, be very careful with this because drinking too much alcohol in the heat can really predispose to some of these issues. And finally, people with memory issues. They may not be able to respond as quickly to temperature changes, whether it's dressing appropriately or drinking water when they need. <clears throat> so heat exhaustion, <clears throat> like I said, is kind of a spectrum. Uh, we start looking at things like dizziness, thirst, a lot of sweating, nausea, weakness, just kind of feeling a little bit out of it. And this is when you really have to act. You move to a cooler area, loosen or take off some clothing, drink cool water. And if things really aren't getting better after a while, after you've hydrated, that's when you may need to seek medical attention. 
when you definitely need to seek medical attention are these signs of heat stroke. If you're not just feeling a little out of it, but if you're truly confused, if you're very dizzy to the point where you feel like you might pass out or to the point you actually do pass out, this is usually a medical emergency. You need to call 911. While you're waiting for 911, get that person or get yourself out of the heat as much as possible. Take clothing off, cooling that person down with cool water, or if you have it, putting some ice packs on them can be really helpful. Because heat stroke can cause death, it can cause permanent disability if you're not acting quickly. Heat cramps, now to jump to something a little less severe, a little less scary, are these painful brief muscle cramps that happen during exercise, usually in heat or shortly after. Most commonly happens in our larger muscle groups, so the calves, thighs, and shoulders. And it's really caused by changes in our fluid balance. Less fluid, electrolyte shifts, especially sodium and potassium. Can be really helpful to drink a sports drink if you are experiencing heat cramps. Um, or it's something with salt in it. The kind of cheap and easy way to do it is obviously if you do not have heart failure or if you're not on a low salt diet, putting a quarter to a half a teaspoon of salt in some water and drinking that relatively quickly. Now, if you're unable to drink due to nausea um, and you have heat cramps, you may, that may be a sign that there's more going on than just heat cramps meaning are you developing heat exhaustion and heat stroke? Do you need that? Do you need to be seen sooner and actually get some IV fluids? Sometimes that happens, uh, but again, not all the time. So some really basic considerations on the hottest days of the year, consider staying inside, consider staying in cooler places, especially if your pollution indices are high. Um, on hot days, that hole in the ozone layer tends to be a little worse. Um, we, we are letting more sun through. We are um, dealing with sometimes unhealthy air quality in addition to all these other risks that we've talked about. Hydrate well, wear loose fitting clothes made of natural fabrics such as cotton that allow breathing to some degree. Um, and I know this is the exact opposite thing I just told you all about sun protection as far as wearing clothes that cover up, um, but we need to consider they are competing interests to some degree. Now, the city of Philadelphia does make cooling centers. Not everybody has access to air conditioning. Um, during hot weather, the city does open up these cooling centers. Here are a couple of the ones that they, that they have currently kind of scattered all over the city. Some cities have started giving away air conditioning units to older adults uh, who might have lower incomes. They are in theory working on this, but we have not gotten there in Philadelphia yet. So we'll stop for questions. And this is the end of the content that I had. I'm happy to take questions on any of what we've talked about so far. Um, so we'll go from there. I just wanted to throw one resource in also that during the very hot temperatures, uh, PCA, if you call their helpline, uh, they turn it into a heat line uh, that can refer you to some of those cooling centers. Um, and I'll, I'll find that number and put it in the chat here too. Uh, there was a question that came in from Eric, and I think this was when you, Michael, were talking about heat exhaustion. Yes. Um, but does drinking things other than water, specifically sugary drinks, maybe soda, is that still good at helping with dehydration or is that a, a stay away? It's not as good. So the, here's the hard thing. A lot of sports drinks do have a good amount of sugar, but they try to balance it with electrolytes meaning the things that are going to help your body stay, for, remain in a good hydrated state. If you're drinking, say, a Coca-Cola, you actually run the chance of dehydrating yourself even more. A couple of reasons for that. One, um, the body, when it gets a sugar load, like if you drink a, a, bottle, a 12 ounce bottle of Coca-Cola, you're getting probably around a little over 100% of your daily recommended sugar intake. That combined with the caffeine in some of those drinks, can actually make you pee more. Um, the sugar alone can make you pee more when it's at that high levels. So drinking things like Coke, Sprite, um, not generally recommended for rehydration. Um, similarly, you need to be careful with cranberry juice as well. I know it's not most people's go-to. Cranberry juice is a natural diuretic. It makes people pee. So you need to be a little bit careful with that one as well.
Great, thank you. Other questions, so feel free to put those in the chat uh, or the Q&A. And if not, we can uh, move on. Yeah, so that's actually the end of my talk. Um, I think we ended a little bit early here. I'm gonna pause my share so I can kind of oh, see folks here. And um, oh, wonderful. And and so in that case, really, if there are any more questions on any of the content, either the the sun protection, the skin cancer, uh, the summer safety, uh, folks can ask any of those questions. And if not, it's okay if we end a couple minutes early. This was very, uh, very thorough. Just check me to get anything on Facebook. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, all right. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for, for sharing all this information. Uh, congratulations on finishing up the geriatric fellowship. Uh, and again, excited that we'll be able to have you back next year during the uh, palliative care fellowship. Absolutely. Not done with me yet. Thanks as always yes. for uh, organizing and for being so engaged.